Good afternoon. This is April 30th, 1998, and we're here at the Morse Institute Library in Natick, Massachusetts, interviewing Horace Fader. Good afternoon, Mr. Fader. I'm going to ask you a few questions, and then from those questions, if you also want to expand on some of your experience with regards to World War II, feel free to do that. First of all, your full name? Horace Evans Fader. And Mr. Fader, if you don't mind it, it, my asking, what is your current age and your address? I was born in 1921, so I'm 77. Uh, my current address is Rockland Street, this town. And you are married? Yes, I am. For how long have you been married? I've been married for 51 years. And your wife's name? Mildred. And I know you have children. I do. How many? I have uh, two daughters, the oldest is 50, and a son, who is the youngest, and he's 43. And grandchildren? None. Mm -hmm. And where were you born? I was born in Boston, Massachusetts. You were raised in Boston also? No, I was raised up until a year, 10 years old in Wellesley. Uh, and I still own the house that I was raised in, in Wellesley. My father died in 1931, and I was sent away to a military school for five years. What military school that was, was that? That was Thompson's Academy but it, in Boston Harbor. Mm. It had a different name then, but it wouldn't. Uh, history swallows these things, you know. <laughs> is Thompson's Academy, I assume, on Thompson's Island? It is. Mm -hmm. Is the building still there? No, the main building burned down. And you were sent there after the age of? Well, I was 10 years 10. old. 10. Just what, turning 11. Was that a difficult time for you? Well, when your father dies and you're tore away from the, your usual social environment and you go to a school which is really rather harsh, and uh, I've always been somewhat of a rebel. That had just enhanced my, my uh, <coughs> rebelness. And how long did you go to that school? I went there five years, five and a half. Having gone there for five years, did you foresee that you would then also have a career in the service or a p part of a career in the service? Well, that's an interesting thing because I did want a career in the service and uh, at that part of the school I was on what we used to call the boats, but I'd studied seamanship and, and uh, piloting and that sort of thing. I was rather skilled at it because I enjoyed it. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, when I graduated, I came to Natick. I went to Natick High School for a year and then started my adventures. I, when I turned 18, I applied to all of the services, and I was rejected by all of the services, because in those days, if you wore glasses, you were unfit <laughs> physically. Mm -hmm. uh, the lighthouse service accepted me, however, but I didn't feel I wanted to attend a lighthouse. That was a, yeah. a lighthouses on the eastern shore? Oh yeah, mm -hmm. well, wherever they sent you. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, being unable to join the military, I joined the National Guard when I turned 18, and that was, of course, in 1939. If you have a picture of history, you can see the significance of it. What actually happened was that we went away for maneuvers in 1939 at Plattsburgh, New York, and it didn't take too much imagination to realize, although we weren't aware of it at the time, uh, that we weren't out there to exercise or teach privates anything. The American general officers had little experience in handling armies at the core and army level, and they needed the experience, and so they tossed us around. We were in the exercises in August of 1939, and if you know your history, in September of 1939, the Nazi army attacked uh, Poland uh, on the very earliest days, 1st or 2nd of September. It was interesting to note at that time that the American army was literally smaller than the Latvian army, the Polish army, the Swedish army. There were not many armies in Europe that wasn't bigger than the American army. Our Congress is very careful in saving money on military. Uh, but uh, that was the situation at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, interesting enough, on those maneuvers for the first time, we had horse cavalry, soldiers with horses, the third uh, regiment of cavalry was stationed up at Fort Eaton, Allen, Vermont, 
and they were in the maneuvers, as was the one-tenth cavalry of the Massachusetts National Guard. That's so that how we, we were really ready for a modern, modern war, you know. And were you in that National oh, Guard? I, yes, Calvary I was in the National Guard, in the, in the quartermaster company uh, that was in the Natick Armory, 101st Quartermasters, Company A. When you joined this group at the age of 18, yep. at that time, did you have friends in this area that joined with you? Well, that's one of the reasons you get into the National Guard. You have some friends there that tow you down after you've been greased properly. <laughs> <laughs> and, and these were Natick residents also? Yes. Do you care to mention any of their names? Yes, Wesley Amazine. He's, he, well, I'm going to be naming people who are dead now, but uh, he was chiefly the one that brought me in. He, was, uh, he stayed in the Army and uh, made it a career. He did. Now, after the National Guard, how long were you in that? group for? Well, the, the service went on a little further. I stayed with the company for another year, 1940, another two years, I guess, actually, uh, because at the second maneuvers we had, which is now Camp Drum, uh, we were so ready for war, we had taxi cabs painted with the word tank on them so that our general officers had a chance to move tanks around. It didn't exist. We had uh, Stove pipes for mortars and sticks for machine guns, and things were building. <laughs> the amazing thing of it is, you're looking at the United States that was not prepared in any way for a war. And as the story goes on, you'll see how it evolved. I see. So, being in the National Guard, when you made the switch over to the Army? Well, the National Guard was federalized in 1941. Okay. And at that time, because I'm a musician, the chief bandmaster of the division talked me into joining the 101st Engineer Band, which I was very happy to do because we, I, one of the best periods of my life was in that band. We played all day long and half the night. <laughs> and what instrument did you play? Well, I was playing trombone in the band, but I played through the brass section. Doing something like this, did you have to go through the typical basic training that others went through? No. As a matter of fact, they didn't have basic training in those days. Uh, when you signed up for any branch of the service in any unit, uh, the unit trained you. They were responsible for your training. Okay. And could you mention again what unit you were in, just for well, factual I was, information? Well, when the, when the guard was uh, federalized, I was in the 101st Engineer Regiment in the band. At what point then did things change for you with regards to <laughs> band musician versus war? Well, you see, I'd already had a military experience as a young man. Being in the service was no stress on me at all. It was no different than you going from one home to another. Uh, the regularity of life didn't bother me. I was adjusted to it. Uh, I was so adjusted to it that I could take advantage of it at will. <laughs> and this is why you're in the States? This is in the States, mm -hmm. yes. And what areas in the, in the U.S. were you Well, we were stationed to? in Camp Edwards, which was down in Cape Cod. Cape Cod. Mm -hmm. And then did you travel from there to... Yes, as a matter of fact, we traveled from there for maneuvers in Carolina, uh, which was in 1941 in the early part of the summer, uh, we went by truck and we uh, went the entire distance on trucks and bivouacs at night time. It was kind of an interesting experience. Okay, and what about direct combat? Tell me well, about that. Well, I, I want to stress the fact, and, and I'm very sensitive about this too, because I have such deep uh, respect for infantrymen that I was not an infantryman, I was a combat engineer. We, of course, from time to time were exposed to hazards, uh, but we weren't in the business of primarily of destroying the enemy, and uh, jungle warfare was a very, very deeply personal thing, very, very close. It was not shooting someone 50 yards away. This, the, all of this killing was done at a very, very close range. So these people had, I had tremendous respect for them. Later on, as the story unfolds, I'll tell you some stories of, of my association with the infantry, but. Oh, well, you uh, can certainly tell us yeah. about this. Well, what had happened was, my, uh, I should bring you in, uh, up to focus here. I took the West Point exams uh, before I went to the Carolina maneuvers. And while I was down there, I was informed I passed them. And I had to come back from the maneuvers. And uh, that, uh, I came back and went to West Point prep up at Fort Devens. 
And it was, it was very flattering because, as a matter of fact, there were only 30 of us in the first and second core area, which included all of the Northeast, including Pennsylvania and New York and New Jersey. So there was a, quite an honor to be chosen. But unfortunately, you see, they had passed my, passed my physical for OCS and not West Point. And so I went to the school and had advantage of the education, but I couldn't go to West Point when they finally arrived. They, they didn't notice I wore glasses for so long, you know. But anyway, that's what happened. So I had completed that part of the course, which uh, would, would have ordinarily qualified me uh, for West Point, uh, but I was rejected. And the war broke out then. It was like I went home and came back, and, and while I was home, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. So I came back, and they gave us the opportunity then. They said, you have Huell Drum's signature in any OCS you want to go to. But I was probably driven by the idea of adventure. And, and at this point in time, you were 20 or 21 years old? I was 21 old? then. 21 years yeah. old. Uh, well, coming up to 21. Uh, I think the important thing to remember here is this is one of the opportunities I had to advance in the military, but I, I turned it down. I went back to the band, uh, was broken to private by request, and went into uh, what was then E Company of the 101st Engineers. And at I became an engineer soldier. Engineer soldier, okay. And then where did that take you? Well, uh, what had happened was the 32nd Infantry Division was brought east to be shipped over to Ireland for the uh, buildup of forces in Europe, and their engineer battalion had been sent on ahead. Well, they usually are sent on ahead to prepare the ground for them, that sort of thing. And uh, after they lost their engineer battalion, it was on the high seas, someone came and said, we need you in the Pacific. So they tapped our battalion, because they were breaking the divisions up then from square, square divisions to triangular divisions. Can you, can you explain that a little bit? Oh, sure. Uh, the old divisions were made up of two brigades. Each brigade had two regiments, so that you had four regiments in a division. And how many people are we talking here? Oh, you're talking 14,000, 14, 15,000. Now, what they did was that they eliminated what would be called a combat team, I suppose. They took uh, one battalion of engineers and they took one regiment of infantry and th that sort of thing and a, and, a, and a battery of uh, artillery and that sort of thing and made it into a combat team and moved them away from the division. So the division then ended up with three regiments of infantry and the balance artillery and one battalion of engineers and, and other troops, medical and that sort of thing. But it was triangularized actually to meet the design of the German army. Because the American army always takes their traditions from the British army and their, and their tactical uh, applications from the German army, which is a very wise thing to do. <laughs> but anyway, that's what happened. The, I would point out that the first battalion of our regiment that w went out with the 182nd Infantry, and they eventually formed the Americal Division. This probably means nothing to you, but that today is a regular army division and they went to Guadalcanal, and they relieved the Marines there. Uh, but we went with the 32nd Division, and we went over. As a matter of fact, when we went overseas, we were the first complete division transported across the water in the war. It was the first. So you see, we were in it very easily. As a matter of fact, I think I passed the, the equator, and we recognized the fact that we were now uh, shellbacks. Uh, nice term, uh, uh, and the 30th of April. Uh, very briefly after that, the Battle of the Coral Sea broke out and I, we had to divert our convoy south. Instead of going to Sydney, we went to Adelaide, Australia, South Australia. Another comment to make on it was that we only had, the Navy was cut to nothing. And the only thing we had for an escort was the very fine, beautiful cruiser, the Indianapolis which would be very effective against surface raiders, but absolutely useless against submarines. And when you stop and realize that the Japanese had beautiful submarines and the best torpedo in the war, throughout the war, we were just lucky they never found us. <laughs> We'd have had uh, 10 ships down. The Indianapolis, incidentally, was sunk at the end of the war by a, a Japanese submarine with one of those long lance torpedoes, two of them, I think. It's interesting, isn't it? Very interesting, yes. Going over 
in a ship as you were doing. This is your first experience in travel? Well, yes, as a matter of fact, <laughs> we crossed the country on, uh, on uh, military uh, cars that I'd never seen before in a sense. Uh, but it was a very exciting time. I can remember going across the country and going for mile after mile after mile, sealing the Rockies, but we never got to them. They just seemed to be there for days. And going along and suddenly looking and seeing a cowboy sitting on a horse, a scants in a saddle, watching a troop train go by. And it kind of impressed me because he was a lonesome cowboy. Sure, and then going also over to um, Australia, as you mentioned. That's right, we went to Australia. And, and was that more exciting, more? Well, I think probably the simplest way to explain that is to point out that when the war broke out, a tremendous number of Australian men joined the Australian Imperial Forces, which could be sent anywhere. And they went to the Middle East and fought and to Greece, and I think some of them were in Crete too. We eventually had the 7th Division with us in the first battle, uh, but they were seasoned soldiers having fought the, the Germans for a couple of years while we were raw. <laughs> I never even knew it. So did you look up to that group as someone you could learn from? Well, I was very friendly with them. I was, because I was an engineer soldier again, I was assigned to Australians from time to time. I was assigned to the light horse with their tanks. and. Uh, uh, once again, I had this very deep respect for these people who are going into battle. Uh, uh, so when they, they would be coming in, some of them after you, because would you be setting Oh no, they were, deep, they were right with us. Right with you. This is in the first campaign I'm talking about. When we were in Australia, we were we landed in South Australia by accident in a sense, and uh, we trained to fight on Australian soil and the original thought was that we would defend Australia from the invading Japanese who were coming down and they were then in northern New Guinea. Uh, they transported us then up to Brisbane. Well, we had our first division casualty uh, of a boy who was, uh, we shipped some of our supplies up uh, by ship and the Japanese t torpedoed it. And so our first kid in our division that was killed was killed as a result of a torpedoing. Yeah. Was that sort of a rude awakening for you that this was well, real? Well, not really, because it's strangely enough, all of these things I'm telling you, and as you see as the story unfolds, I wasn't particularly concerned. I swear to God, I was going to live forever, and it didn't bother me. If you can understand that state of mind, of course, it's still a little touch of madness, you understand. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we went up to northern Australia, and uh, we were there for a couple of months, and then they decided, MacArthur had decided, uh, uh, that we were all through with this backing up and defending. We were going to attack, and he threw us into a battle and an attack situation, which was probably the most desperate situation of World War II. And strangely enough, the only place I've ever seen it recognized was on a battlement in West Point, where they had the word Boona up there. I'm sorry, what is the word? Boona. B-U-N-A. And do you want to sort of expand on that whole piece? Well, yes, I, I, I will. Uh, first, I want to point out to you, that we were National Guard troops. Uh, this is not to cast a slur on the National Guard, because of course in the, in the, in the, there were more National Guardsmen fighting in the Pacific than there were Marines or regulars. And uh, as a matter of fact, my division had the longest combat time in the war in the Pacific. Now that's a long time. They started at Booner and they ended at Luzon. The last kid killed in the war was an infantryman in the 32nd Infantry Division. May I go a step further? Yes. The Tiger of Malaya, who was the commander of Japanese forces in Luzon, surrendered to mm -hmm. the 32nd. Very interesting. So it's a, but nobody knows about it. It's, it's a hidden story. But the Battle of Buna was very basically one in which the Japanese had attempted prior to that at the Coral Sea Battle to go around uh, the south east corner of New Guinea and establish a base at Port Moresby. Uh, the Navy stuffed them off. Uh, incidentally, the Hornet was sunk about that time by a Japanese submarine. So it goes to show you they were very active. You'll see later on some of the beautiful little byplays in this. But at the time, the Japanese had mounted an offense across the mountains in New Guinea. Now, New Guinea is an island, this is the second largest island in the world, but it goes to a mountains about Oh, 12,000 12, feet, and they do it in a very short space of lateral time. So consequently, the, uh, the 
the Japanese were very daring uh, to attempt this, but they went over the top. The, of course, the Australians were resisting them then, and came down the other side, and almost within range of Port Moresby, their objective. They ran out of supplies. And at that time, American troops were now being engaged with them, with the Australian militia. Uh, and they held them, and, and uh, they went back. Two of our battalions went back over the range. They weren't worth an awful lot when they got on the other side, because it's a very strenuous uh, task. But when we got over there, we found out that we couldn't bring in our tank destroyers. We couldn't bring in our artillery. Uh, we were supplied with Dutch cutlasses because they didn't have machetes. And and this cutlass. is in the jungle war, all right? We had uh, leather shoes, uh, which would rot off in three, four weeks, and you'd have to get another pair of shoes or go barefoot. Uh, the battle itself was one. If you want to compare it to Guadalcanal, I'll give you an idea. In Guadalcanal, the people fighting there always outnumbered the Japanese. They had the defensive positions on high ground. When we attacked Abuna, the Japanese had the defensive positions on the high ground. See what I'm saying? The people in Guadalcanal had naval support. We had no navy at all. Uh, we finally worked out a technique of sneaking supplies up the coast in barges. You had to hide them in the daytime. I wasn't part of that operation, but of course I was in the receiving end of it. Uh, I have seen American troops come off the line who had been in the water fighting in the swamps and the skin would be fall, come falling off them because you know it, if you leave your hand in the water too long, uh, this is a, almost an impossible thing. I, I, I could spend five hours talking about this battle and every bit of it would be absolute sheer horror. Uh, but we beat them. And not only did we beat them, but we turned in the first completed offensive campaign of World War II of any part of the war. And that was a Papuan campaign, which included the action at uh, Gona, Buna, and San Ananda Point. Did you realize at that time what a remarkable thing had just occurred? Well, I think there were some things that were remarkable about it. One of them was we had 80% casualties. Uh, you were not relieved from duty unless your temperature was 104. We had no way of supplying. All of the people came in by air that hadn't climbed over the mountains. Uh, the airstrip was cut out with <laughs> Dutch cutlasses. And you see what are, I'm saying? Can you explain a Dutch cutlass? Well, a Dutch cutlass is like a sword. Oh. You know, we, we, we look like uh, the Knights of Columbus. <laughs> But it was all right. Uh, you know, this is what we had. We had substituted equipment uh, because we'd lost so much of our equipment uh, in the torpedoing of the ship, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, we, uh, we were shot. We were also not trained for jungle warfare. We were in horrible shape, and we thought we were going to win the war that day. Incidentally, something that's amusing uh, that I think uh, that when we went up we went up on a ship, a, a Dutch uh, inter-island freighter named the Van Heemskerk. We became a very dear vessel in the early days of the war because she was such a, a, a daunted little vessel, you know, that was being attacked continuously. And she was sunk within a couple of weeks after they brought us in. But I can remember that we put our guns from our battalion on the boat. There was no navy. The gun crew on the boat was army. Uh, the crew were Javanese, the officers were Dutch. And we felt pretty confident, let those submarines come for us, and we'd show them a thing. And we never even had any idea they could stand outside of our range and just pop us off. But uh, it was interesting. When we landed in Port Moresby, we were greeted by the Japanese Air Force, and they bombed us. And uh, they missed, <laughs> as you can see. <laughs> but it was a nice way to get welcomed. And uh, we were bombed every day. And in the early part of the war, you know, uh, the Japanese, as certainly the Germans too, had the upper hand and they, they played uh, the game the way they wanted. There was an air wing up, uh, naval air wing up in the lay. Uh, the top Japanese ace was there. Well, they all ended up top aces. He had 104 kills. The top American ace had 38. It gives you some idea of what the odds were at that time. An American pilot flying down there 
flying uh, warhawks or era cobras. We have no match for those zeros at all. They were just chewed up. Did you still feel at that time that you were untouchable? You had mentioned that a little earlier. Do you think uh, that's what bit. helped you through all of this? Well, I, 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 I had a belief. I was rather quick. You know, you, you, you couldn't catch me standing around lo lo loitering. But I thought, in a sense, that they, they, they weren't going to get me. Somehow I had that feeling. I, I, it's a feeling of silly confidence. Of course, I've been scared out of my wits from time to time, but, but I, I never thought of being planted there. But you said 80% casualties. Oh, yes. Well, of course, a lot of this is disease, too, you know. Such as? Well, you name it. They had, in New Guinea, they had everything but frostbite. You name it, they had a scrub typhus, and most of us in the Pacific uh, had, had those conditions. It's malaria was rampant, black water fever, you died from it. There was no, you know, once you got that, that was a tertiary, a quaternary fever. And that was a, that was a finishing touch. So yep. you had an 80% 80 80% of our loss. division was gone. You had a division that was not prepared ahead of time oh, yeah. for war. You were quick on your feet. Were there well, you're talking about me. The other survivors, I too, agree. that were quick on their feet. But talking about you, oh. do you feel that a lot of your personality and your positive sense that you weren't going to get hurt helped you through a lot of this? Oh, I think so. Mm -hmm. I think that, uh, once again, I'm going to go back to those poor devils in the infantry. Uh, I could spend hours talking about them, of some of the officers I knew who were extraordinary leaders. But, uh, you know, these people, they had to believe that they were going to say, how could you do this job unless you knew that they couldn't get you? <laughs> sure. But you had to be quick. You had to help yourself a little bit, you know? Now, having been in this type of atmosphere, were you with close friends, people that you had made friendships with? Well, actually, <laughs> I don't know how to tell you this because it, uh, yeah, I was kind of a product I was, a, I, I was perceived to be a Yankee. Well, my mother was a Yankee. Of course, my father wasn't, but my mother was. And where was your father and, from? Well, he was from Nova Scotia. But this particular outfit uh, was predominantly of a, of a uh, uh, clannish group who looked down upon Yankees. They held us responsible for all of their ills. And consequently, it was a very, it was, it was kind of made uh, uh, a military career very difficult with them. However, I, I adjusted to it very nicely and, and I didn't bother me. Do you remember any really low points during this time period? I think the lowest that I felt in the war, and I'm going to have to be a little tough about this, we were at Sador. It was a, at that time of the war, we're going up to 44 now, really 44. We had, the, we had the Japanese pretty well contained. They would literally, they, they had, at one place where we landed, they, flew, they, they fled when they knew that the 32nd was coming. I'm sure. The 32nd had. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, at Sador, I was detached uh, on a machine gun post. Uh, defending the uh, headquarters company. Could I interrupt here? Can you spell Sador and tell us? S-A-I-D-O-R. It's on the northern coast of New Guinea. Thank you. I'm sorry, go ahead. Don't oh, sorry. Should have brought a map with me. We will have maps, just to let you know that oh, okay. people can then look at to yeah. sort of have a visual of what they're hearing from you. So go ahead, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, in this particular place, it was a very soft job for me. I should tell you that my first sergeant, after a while, decided that he was, that I was being mistreated. I didn't feel mistreated, but he thought I was. And he told me uh, that I would never have Cape P again as long as I was in the outfit. I'm still a private. And he didn't. I never had Cape P again, which I hated. If the officers knew how much I hated it, they'd have put me there all the time. But, <laughs> but he kept me off that. But anyway, th that's on the side. Uh, one of the ways he kept me from having KP was he always sent me off on details where I wasn't around, you know, that sort of thing. So I had a lot of experience, interesting experiences. He was a dear boy. Do you remember his name? Yes. And I'm good at names too. Stapleton. I think he died last year. Joseph Stapleton is a very good man. 
Well, anyway, to go back to this, I was on that particular spot. We were not being bothered by Japanese air as much as we used to be. They were pretty much contained. They were still flying, I think, uh, out of Rabaul, which was the northern part of the uh, New Ireland, uh, New Britain Island. And we were there one night, and I was laying in the bunk, and uh, I heard a plane overhead flying quite high. And I turned to my bunkmate, and I told him, I said, that's a Japanese plane. Now, I was a musician, and I have an ear. And the Japanese planes always had a, a, a little, I won't call it a counterpoint, but it was a, uh, and I could pick it up. The American planes didn't do that. And I told them, that's Japanese. They said, no, it's not Japanese. The, uh, the aircraft haven't fired the three warning shots. It can't be Japanese. Well, I listened and laid there and listened to that plane up there, and all of a sudden I didn't hear it anymore. And it kind of put me awake, and I was alert. And all of a sudden the engine burst right overhead, and I went off that bunk so fast, you know, gr gravity is a beautiful thing. I hit the ground about the same time the bombs went off. And at that particular raid, most people since World War II have not had to worry about air raids. But uh, we lost 23 killed, and I don't know how many wounded. They had a lot of purple hats there. And that evening, I, I spent most of my time in my tent bandaging my brothers. I was scratched. I was quick enough, so I just get scratched. Uh, and I bandaged a very dear friend of mine who I have a little caricature at home that he did off me. He was an artist. Uh, and a, a very dear memento. I don't have many mementos, but that's one. Uh, and I banished him, just barely got the field dressing on his backside, which had been ripped off, nicely sliced. And then I went to looking for, for more people and they needed help because we were in desperate shape. You can understand the medics couldn't possibly handle it all. And I came across a very dear friend of mine who uh, was a fellow engineer soldier, fellow private, belonged to a little private group. Uh, and he was hit very bad. And uh, I got down and he was begging for water and I couldn't give him any water because his stomach was ripped open and uh, he died. Mm. Very difficult experience, I'm sure. Well, I hate this. Well, Freddie Wynette, he was a Jewish kid from Cleveland and we used to get into mischief together. And we were mischief, but well, we made we went around the American Army like nothing you ever saw. We had our own techniques, but I missed him dearly. He was a, a beautiful man. All his, uh, all his mother got for Fred was a purple hat. And the next day, the medical officer asked me if I, you know, if I wanted a purple hat, and that's all I could think of. I got scratched, and he got killed, and, and I, I couldn't equate the two. I didn't, didn't want it. So that took care of that. But that was probably the most dreadful time I had with respect to other people. Sure. I had my own dreadful times with respect to just me. <laughs> Do you want to talk about that? Well, there are some things I'd rather talk about that I did in the war that were very delightful experiences, but I will give you an example. As a result of the bombardment, uh, the bombing of our headquarters, uh, most of our sergeants and most of the NCOs that were on special assignments for intelligence and operations and supply and that's how they were killed. Uh, now, as I indicated to you before, I was trained as a kid. Uh, I could read a map. Yeah, I could make a map. You know, the techniques of strides, there's uh, two paces and uh, you, you've got five feet and uh, you've got a compass and, uh, you know, it, you can actually do that. And as a result of it, in the final campaign that I was in, the final battle uh, at the Drinamore River, we had our division and another green division, the 31st, and a Texas cavalry outfit. And we were faced with the Japanese 18th Army, which was nine divisions. So we had a lot of things to worry about. Our cavalry reconnaissance troop did all the patrolling beyond the Drinamore River. And we were responsible for, re for re uh, reconnaissance up from our own area up to the Drinamore, which we ended up fighting there. But uh, I was an engineer soldier. Uh, they need needed someone that could do maps. And the first thing they asked me to do was lay out some minefields. The infantry hated them. 
but I lay, laid those out. You have to lay them out so you can pick them up again. <laughs> so you have to have a little bit of expertise. And they discovered that I could do that. And so they finally pulled me in and they asked me to take over the job of reconnaissance agent. Well, it was supposed to be three, but we were shorthanded. They didn't have anybody to do it. So I ended up being, if you'll pardon the joke, the eyes and ears of my division in terms of engineer reconnaissance. And this is at what time? Oh, this is 1944. 1944. Yeah. Now, this was my last action. Uh, well, because <laughs> nobody else was with me, I had to do the reconnaissance work alone. And I want to let you know that there's nothing in the world quite as terrifying as going out into, I suppose you can call it no man's land, but they were out there and I was out there. It was even worse than that. The natives in that area were, were uh, friendly to the Japanese. And if you had a native opposing you, we had trouble because they, they had very keen senses. They could smell the difference between an American, I'm not joking, and a Japanese. If they were with you, they would tell you these things. Uh, so they could detect me if I were, came within their range. They had good vision, very good hearing. And they were dangerous. Uh, the Australians would catch them. We had orders to shoot them if they're between the lines. Look, it comes up to another interesting story. But anyway, uh, I was out one day on patrol, and I came upon a young native, probably 14 years old, I would guess. And uh, I, I don't, I'm not good at uh, shooting a kid, you know, on it. Of course, on the other hand, I knew he was uh, part of a group of people who were our enemies. But it turned out that it was mistaken because I didn't patrol that area that often because it was a quiet zone. But the next time I went out, the kid was there again. And uh, so he tagged along with me. And uh, he actually saved my life because he warned me about a group of natives <laughs> that I could get my pistol out fast enough so that they wouldn't, uh, you know, have me for lunch because they were cannibals, among other things. But I mean, I owed my life to that kid that I hadn't shot maybe a couple of weeks prior to that, you know. And he probably sensed yeah. that too. I think another one too that was on this, this was the thing that brought me down, this patrolling. If I could get with an infantry patrol, then I would go with them. I could do my work while they did their work. Uh, and at night time, because we didn't come back, you know, we went, these were deep patrols. Uh, we'd put up at a, uh, a village. We'd take a little place over, break all the rules by crossing the stick on the door, that sort of thing. That's the way they locked their house. They just put a stick down. Uh, but we got in them. And uh, they loved me because I used to take some of their grenades and go out and lay them with wire and wire them in so that we could go to sleep in comfort and know that if anybody tripped that wire, it had to be high enough so the pigs wouldn't trip it. But it, you know, that... You just stop a minute, let this go through. They're coming this way. Sorry. But uh, I was a popular guy with them. But I had an interesting experience, and this is probably, well, two of them, as a matter of fact. At one time, I had some infantry with me, but I had to go down a trail to check something out, because we were looking for the ground that the Japanese, if they attacked, which we anticipated they would, uh, they would, I'm looking for the, the avenues of approach that would be feasible. Uh, and I went down there, and I hated that they gave me a carbine, and I hated that thing because I used to put it down, pick up my slope board, and walk away from it. And the carbine? The carbine is a small rifle. And so it's small, it's not too heavy, it's just? No, it was just inconvenient. Right. So I'd be out there, and I'd be doing my little map work, drawing the slope board where you take a sign, you know, that sort of thing, and you're concentrating on what you're doing. And I was out there, and all of a sudden, out of the side of my eyes, I saw a Jap. And that little son of a gun had his rifle on me, and I know he was squeezing one off. And the only thing I could think of doing, I don't know what made me do it. I put my hand in the air and I started to do the standard single, you know, for a assemble, and started to pump my arms, speed it up, and then I walked quietly away and got away with it. You know, so when I went back and told the infantryman, I said, there's a guy out there that damn near jacked me, he wanted to jap, you know. And we went out, and sure enough, his stuff was there, but he, had to, he departed, you know. But uh, that was a closey. I had another closey, too, and it was interesting when you analyze it afterwards. I was on the banks of the Drenamore, and I realized that to know whether this was affordable place in the Drenamore, I had to know that. I had to report it. But that meant I had to walk out into the stream. Now, the stream was... Of course, the crocodiles there were small. They wouldn't bother you. But uh, 
I would say the thing was probably hmm, 35, 40 yards wide. And so I said, what the heck, you have to do it. You, what are you going to do? You're going to let them go blind that they don't know it's an affordable place, if it is? And so I walked out, and sure enough, it was only up to about my ears. And I, somehow I got to the other side in and, and about 10 yards of it, and I said, I don't think I get that curious just about now. And I turned around, and it came back. And I had that horrible feeling that I, I was in somebody's sight. It's, you know, it's, uh, the hair was crawling up my back. That was one of these times I wasn't sure I was going to live forever. And uh, when I came back, two of our infantrymen, when, uh, when I just got up, popped up put their rifles right up to my nose and said, what are you, stupid? <laughs> and said, hey, I had to find out if it was affordable. Sure. You know, someone had to do it. He said, well, we damn near blew you out of the water. The only reason we didn't is we know the Japanese are over there, and if we fired, then they would know where we were. You know, and so the Japanese must have done the same thing. Neither side wanting to shoot, and I walked out of it. It was a, it was a nice feeling. <laughs> Amazing story. Amazing. Yeah. Now, you did mention to me prior to going on camera that you had been injured in the war. Well, at the bombing there in Sador, I took some scratches. I got to the point, of course, you know, when I was doing the reconnaissance work for the engineer battalion, for the division, uh, you can only take so much. Uh, this is the only explanation I have. Uh, I got, tried to get out of bed one morning and I couldn't get up. My back was killing me. And I went down to the medics and told the doctor looked at me and I said, look, uh, uh, I, got this, I can't go on patrol today because my back is killing me and it was painful. And he said, well, I'm going to send you back to the hospital. And I said, well, I don't want to go back. What the hell, you're a doctor. You can take care of me right here. I'm not going anywhere. And uh, he insisted I went back. So they flew me back to the hospital. And where which, was that? Well, that was the hospital was back at Oro Bay, which has an interesting story uh, associated with it. But uh, that was before I ever got up to uh, uh, Idape. But I, I, I went back, and I've never in my mind, I've always wondered if that was something I contracted as a disease, which I got over. It took about two or three weeks, and I don't remember the treatment. Were you hospitalized? For yes, I was hospitalized. Now, when with you it. mentioned Oro Bay, where was that? Oro Bay was in the northern side. Oro Bay was just a little bit to the south uh, east of Buna. I was almost back home again. Mm -hmm. I, I paid it a visit and I didn't recognize the darn thing, so <laughs> that took care of that. But uh, yeah, Oro, that was the site of Oro Bay. But as I was saying, I woke up in the bed and I looked up and there was a Japanese looking at me. And I, you know, <laughs> this is the kind of thrill I don't need. And uh, there was a medical fellow walked in, one of the orderlies, and he said, oh, he's all right, he's one of ours now. And uh, it, it, I discovered that after talking to these people, that when the Japanese were captured, and they did surrender, that because of the cultural demands that they had placed upon them as they were soldiers, uh, now, they had lived. I mean, they had entered a whole new world. And they became very, very helpful and, uh, you know, they were very, very good assistants. Mm -hmm. it is, most people wouldn't believe that, but, uh, but they had quite a few of these Japanese in this hospital. Of course, they thrilled the hell out of any guy that woke up and saw one for the first time. <laughs> now, could you communicate with them? Well, I could communicate with natives because I did pidgin English pretty well. <laughs> But uh, I didn't speak Japanese, no. But you, you can communicate with people who don't speak your language. I have a bass, uh, bass drum player in my band who's a Russian. He can't speak English. We still communicate, more or less. <laughs> so now you're talking 1944. Yeah. And earlier you were talking about being federalized back in 1941. 40, well, 41, yes. 41. Did you get any time off during that period? Oh, sure. You don't have time for me to tell you my spectacular deeds in Australia. <laughs> As a matter of fact, they're censored. <laughs> when you got time off, would it usually be a week, a month? Well, no. Days? Usually you'd have time off on weekends or something like that. Uh, of course, I had every weekend off because I spoke Australian. I had worked out, I had detailed deals, deals going in the Army you wouldn't believe. but. Uh, no, I had one two-week leave down in Sydney. 
and uh, Sydney, Australia. I had, I, I got in all kinds of interesting things. I was standing on a street corner in Brisbane uh, and I didn't want to go to a bar because I had something scheduled for that evening. I didn't want to drink uh, because I used to do a pretty good job on that and I f thought that this was something I should be sober for. And it was across the street from the police station. And uh, I walked in and uh, they wanted to know what I wanted and I told them when I was a kid I'd gone through Boston Police Headquarters in Massachusetts and it was very interesting. They said, would you like to go through here? And I said, sure. So I went through the place. Now I established a contact with the Brisbane police in, in headquarters, you know. I got to know the detectives and they were very proud of showing me all their things. You get a kick out of this now. This is the, I, I tell you, I had a wonderful life. And uh, so anyway, they uh, went down to ballistics and the fellow showed me what he had. And then he come out with an M1 rifle. He says, look what the MPs gave me. And I, he said, I don't have any ammunition. I said, I'll take care of it. So I fed him ammunition, you know, and uh, we got to be pretty friendly. So when I came back from the first campaign, and I went back and showed that I was unscathed, and, and here I am. Of course, I only weighed 137 pounds, but <laughs> there was all of me, baby. <laughs> Did you lose weight? Oh, sure. How much? Oh, I weighed 144 to 137, yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, I, I, I can go on about Boona forever, but that was a place that there would be days when they would come down and say, you have a choice. You can have shoes, ammunition, or food. And it was dropped out of planes, not for parachutes, it was dropped. And uh, some of it got to the Japanese, and if you, you, you prayed to God if they were dropping cans of ham, that they were coming, or, or uh, cheese was another one. That would, you know. But uh, that campaign was completely air supplied. Remember once again, no Navy. Now this is a, comparing this to Guadalcanal, you see how, you know, we were really uh, kind of neglected. <laughs> but, uh, Yes, that, that, was the, the, that was the story on that, you know, on the supplies, it's all airborne. I flew in to Buna, uh, the Dobodora, because our company was the last company to go up. And I flew in in Hudson bombers, which were modified uh, Lockheed Electras, which is the same plane that Amelia Earhart was lost in. Now, as we came up over the mountains, uh, I think I was the sec in the second or third plane. There were only two in the plane. They had no one to man the gun. <laughs> it's a ridiculous war, I'm going to tell you. Uh, we couldn't go back because we were starting down. Uh, and they said the, the, the Japanese were over, over Buna, so <laughs> where do we go? So anyway, uh, the rest of them aborted and they went back. They came up the next day. But uh, we landed at Dobadura, dove out of the plane. The planes took off. I don't know where they went. But uh, because the zeros were up there and they, they got my attention, really, because I had never been strafed before and, and I never knew, you know. <laughs> and I learned very quickly that uh, if you saw a zero, if you saw an American plane banking, you know, coming around like this, well, you could forget him because he could never get in on you. But if you saw a zero banking, like, keep your eye on him because that guy could turn on a dime and he was on you. But uh, it was interesting, you know. Do you think that's where they got the term hit the ground running? Uh, I don't, I never heard the term, I heard the, <laughs> hit the ground. Well, we had special training by a fellow named Botcher, who had been a veteran of, uh, had been a veteran of the Spanish Civil War. Uh, he was a refugee from Germany. And he was probably the most gifted soldier I ever knew. And he took us and trained us on patrolling, that's why I'm still alive. And when we patrol, we trolled at a half trot as much as possible. Always looking, searching, no matter where you went, always ahead of you, looking for cover. Because when you were fired on, he expected you to be down before the second shot. And that's, if you want to call that quick, that's quick. And that's probably what also helped Oh, well, that's you. undoubtedly that many, many men in my division are alive because of the patrolling, te the, the patrolling techniques were honed so that they knew, they, they thought cover when they moved. They could do it out the corner of their eye while they're looking for something else, you know. How long a period of time were you over there? I was over there just under three years. And then when, when you came home, how did you come home? Well, I came home by another troop transport. Directly? I came home from Hollandia, which, which is? again, you know, a, a, a little touch of something that caught my eye. We pulled in behind a little island chain off the coast of New Guinea, and I don't know where it was. It might have been down around Milne Bay, but I'm not sure. And uh, 
a tanker came alongside and began to refuel us. And I was just looking at the ship, because I like ships. And I was on 10 of them during the war, you know, as I told you. But uh, I was looking at this oiler and watching the guys in the deck, and I happened to look down at the taffrail, and there was a Norwegian flag. You think about it. These guys, their homes were occupied by the Germans. They had no way to write letters to their sweethearts or their family. They were completely isolated. They were still in the war. Even worse than that, they have, were scheduled to move up at the Lady Landings where the Japanese uh, initiated the kamikaze attacks, and they attacked usually the oil tankers. You know, they went up, uh, they went up when they went up. So, I, you know, I didn't know that, but I, I, I had a terrible feeling of, how, how shall I say, uh, uh, these people, uh, you know, away from home, separated from their families. Uh, well, they must have spent a long war if they made it. How often did you hear from home? I'm a terrible letter writer, uh, <laughs> which of course cost me, but that's another story. Uh, I would probably write once a month. Did you have brothers or sisters? No, no brothers or sisters, just my mother. Mm -hmm. That had to be a difficult time for her. Yes, it was. I, I suppose she would be alarmed. Of course, I never told her that. Uh, I, she, she thought I was on a, a carousel, a, a very happy time. Everybody was enjoying themselves. <laughs> now, did you hear about other aspects of the war? Oh, sure. Through the... Sure. Uh, particularly after I got into the intelligence end of the battalion, toward the end, uh, a lot of that stuff came down to us to, to, you know, to give us a place in the war, and I would know things were going on in Europe, for instance, that sort of thing. Uh, and in the Pacific, the actions that was taken in the Central Pacific and that sort of thing. We were up on it. We knew pretty much the, the names of the divisions and who was engaged where and that sort of thing. Now you started off as a private. I ended up as one. Was that by choice also? Yes. And you refused the Purple Heart? Well, that wasn't hard to do, obviously. I was offered at the, the hospital again, but uh, I never forgot my friend Freddie Wynnett, the little devil was a card player. Did you ever get in contact with his family when you returned? No. Mm -hmm. Returning to this area, you're now in your mid-twenties. What was it like coming home? <laughs> well, we had a tremendous amount of respect. Of course, I came home before the war was over. You know, I, I came home. Uh, I didn't really want to come home, as a matter of fact. I'd gone once again to my first sergeant, and he, when they said that my name was on the rotation list, and I told him to take my name off the rotation list because I thought I'd like to stick with the outfit. I'd been with him that long. And he said, well, there are three reasons why you shouldn't do this. Reason number one is your company commander gave me an order a year ago that you were never to receive a decoration, never to receive a promotion, never, well, it's a long story that goes in that, but I, I had a talent for uh, really riling offices. And uh, there was a third thing, but it wasn't important to me anyway. But that's the first thing, it's no big deal. Uh, the second thing is, oh, what the heck was the second reason? I forget now. But the third reason was, and if you don't, and if you don't go on rotation, I have no doubt that your buddies will beat the hell out of you. So that sort of got me thinking. <laughs> did you keep it was time to come home. Did you keep in touch with any of your buddies? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Even the outfit that kept me a private for so long until I finally decided to be a private and they couldn't promote me, I, I belong to the outfit. It's uh, called the Lawrence Light Guard in Medford. And I am a member and I go to their meetings and they all have their ranks down and I'm the only private. Don't you think that doesn't make me really important? <laughs> we could have the asterisk that says by choice on that. No, oh, you don't have to do that. Now, did I'm you, proud to be a private. Once you were on the list to come home, was the war and your service, duty services over at that point? No, as a matter of fact, I should have been relieved from duty uh, around should have been discharged from the service around April or May. I came back and they made an MP out of me. If you can think of anything they would do to me, uh, that would, is terrible. But anyway, and they put me in charge of uh, German prisoners of war. Where uh, was that? That was at Camp Devons. 
Uh, and of course, when the war was over, they didn't need that much supervision anymore. Uh, then they went on town patrol and that sort of thing. But they maintained that I was essential to the war effort because I was an MP with the most disgusting thing I could think of. But <laughs> and how long did that last? Well, they discharged me on the day that they dropped the bomb in uh, June, the 6th of August. August 6th. Oh, you poor historians. August 6th, 19... I'm not going to tell you. This one you have to do yourself, 1945. <laughs> Thank you. All right. But I, I got out of the Army before the war was over. But I should have got out about three or four months earlier. What were your feelings about coming home? Or, Loved it. <laughs> and then once you were discharged, were you, was your mother still living in Natick? My mother at that time, I think, was living in Framingham. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want you to know that when I lived in Wellesley, it was in an area called the Grove. The only way you can get to it is go through Natick. So most of my friends were Natick boys anyway. Uh, when I came back from overseas, I went to live with my aunt, which I had done when I came out of school that many years earlier. And so I was a Natickite then. And where was that? That was in Grove Road in East Natick. Yeah. Was it difficult sort of picking up a regular life no. after? I had three ratings in the service, in the engineers. I was a rigger. Well, of course, this goes back to my good days as a, as a young seaman. And uh, I can tell you a story about that, too, that's kind of fun. You but, can, uh, do. Sure, well, let me go on a little bit. I was a rigger. I was a, a demolition man. And I was pretty good at that, too. I could lay trees down any way you wanted them, or I could pop the ground. And I understood my explosives very well. Uh, and, of course, I was a reconnaissance agent as a result of that. Those were my, and I was a mechanic general. You had to have three ratings in the engineers, and uh, those are my original ones. Uh, oh, rigging? Was that the question? A rigging? Rigging, yes. Oh, you yeah. said you had well, I had, I had two very interesting experiences as a rigger. Uh, one of them, of course, was after the battle at Boona was over, my company was ordered to build a 30-ton bridge over the Oro River, which made it possible for them to bring supplies in from Oro Bay, cross the Oro River, and down to the uh, Dobodura, which ended up being one of the biggest airdromes in the war, airfields, you know. It was a very big field. But a uh, 30-ton bridge, you know. We had to pack in the uh, pile driver on the backs of natives. It had to be all broken down. Uh, and of course, my job of rigging it would be to get the logs snaked down and then line them up and tie them up so that the pile driver could lift them and put them in place. And so we built the bridge uh, with native labor and, and a 30-ton bridge. And that's not bad for a little engineer outfit, isn't it? But my all. best story of rigging that I loved the most was we were coming up uh, for the second time, uh, headed for uh, Good Enough Island, and we stopped off at Oro Bay to drop some cargo off from the number one hold in the ship. It was, incidentally, uh, one of the Liberty ships. I was on three of them during the war, so I got to know them pretty good. But uh, we got on the thing, and uh, an air raid came, in the good old days, you know, and they, they, they began to bomb. And uh, one of the officers in my outfit, which I had determined it wasn't too damn good, finally proved to me that he was an absolute ass. Ran down the gangplank, screaming every man for himself, even a cavalry soldier takes better care of his horse, you know. But anyway, we got off the thing. I mean, there was no sense of rushing. Where were you, you going to go? It's all open, you know. But the result was that the crew of the ship refused to unload it in Morro Bay because Oro Bay was getting bombed. And uh, so they went down to the engineers. Where else do you go? You go to the good guys. And they say, we need some people to unload a ship. I never had so much fun in my life. I would have paid. <laughs> the six of us went down, two of us on the winches. You know, they have one boom sitting right over the hold, cargo hold. They have the other boom over the dock. All right? Now, they have a line going down here, and it's up to the boom through sheaves, and it comes down here through another sheave with a hook on it, and up through another set of sheaves and over there. You ready with me? 
Now, you start it in, and you, this winch would start up, and the other one would have the slack on it, and you'd pull that thing right up, you know. And it was fun because when it came up, you could see what it was, you know. Say, oh, a truck! <laughs> and then what you would do is you would begin to slowly slack off on the one on the left side, and the other one would tighten up on the right side, and then when you got over the dock, you let this one off and just drop it down to the dock. Now you had to have one man on the side, one man over the hold. There was a couple down in the hold. And we didn't care what they did with the stuff after it went over the side. <laughs> you know, <laughs> But anyway, we unloaded the hold. We were very proud of ourselves. No casualties, no mechanics. Why should there be any casualties? <laughs> we had good engineers. That's wonderful. But that was the second one. That was it. it, it we had, I had some good, I'll tell you another thing too that was, I think something that was an eye popping thing. After the Buna, after Buna, we would sit down and talk of how long the war would last. And the argument was somewhere between 10 and 20 years. It was going to have to take that much blood uh, and that much effort to move the Japanese a little distance that we had moved them on, uh, on the Papuan campaign. And you add that to the miles we had to go, it was a long way to go. But we never took into account the fantastic uh, capacity for production. And this, of course, this production capacity was very largely responsible uh, for Douglas MacArthur, who was chief of staff up until 1935, and had set up the industrial, uh, military industrial complex so that they were able to get into this rapidly. The man has never been given credit for many of the things he did. But in any case, I can remember the first time, you know, we went in, first action, we had sabers, Dutch cutlasses. We had shovels and we had picks and that's what we worked with, not axes, and uh, that's what we worked with. We built small bridges, we built uh, corduroy roads, we, uh, some of the stuff was a little in the tender side when you did it, you had to be covered, have covering fire and that sort of thing, but uh, the next time we came up, we were in Good Enough Island and we were building an airstrip there, and this is before the aviation engineers came in, they had special groups of people, and uh, we worked through the night. But this time we had bulldozers and we had power shovels and, and, you know, trucks, all kinds of good stuff. The only th problem was that if you had a bulldozer and you get assigned to these things, we never knew how to run the things. They, the cook, one of our cooks knew how to, he took us out and showed us how to start the gas engine that started the diesel engine, you know. And we practiced until we could use them. Uh, you would be working at nighttime with the lights on. Now, a bulldozer makes a lot of noise. And the warning for an air raid was the three shots in the sky. Now, if you had been looking down at your blade and you're trying to watch your grade as you go along, you're not going to see these three shots and you're never going to hear them. So more than once, you know, <laughs> you're sitting at a bulldozer and all of a sudden you've got all kinds of hell popping around you. Of course, the bulldozer was wonderful protection. You get a chance to get under it. You're all set. But uh, that was in its own way a hairy operation. But we built the field and the Australians came in. We loved the Australians with their P-40s because they were good protection. But uh, yeah. After you were at Camp Devons, and then you stayed with your aunt, what did you do? I, I came out of the Army on the 6th of August, as I indicated to you, and I went across the field uh, down in Wellesley to a place called Stevens Engineering, and I walked in the door and I said, I am a rated demolition man from the Army, and I've just been discharged. And I went to work. So I, I think I had three days off and I went to work as a, a peat man with an entirely different set of restrictions. Now I was using dynamite. I'd never used it before. And I had to learn the different grades of dynamite for lifting charges against shattering charges and, and that sort of thing. But it wasn't, it wasn't long. I caught on pretty quickly. How and, long uh, did you stay in that field? I stayed in a very short period of time because for some reason, uh, I think it was oh, the latter part of November, I got arthritis, and I got arthritis throughout my body, everywhere, every damn joint I had, and uh, that has kept me from working outside or even thinking about working or going outside in the wintertime ever since. I've never had it again, but it was a very painful experience and, uh, you know, to get over it. I'm amazed I got over it so easily. I don't know what it was, something I picked up in the Pacific perhaps, I don't know. Conceivably, it wasn't arthritis. It could have been some sort of a viral thing. Well, they, labeled it they were treating it for arthritis, whatever it was, but it was very painful. And then what did you do as far as a career after that? <laughs> oh, I've had a full and rich and wonderful life. I 
went to Boston University. I graduated. I had intended to go to medical school, but I was married and uh, that was out of the question. I took a job down Tufts Medical School in research and I worked there two years. And then I couldn't do it any longer because uh, I had a chance to get two grants, but the head of the department thought if I got two grants, everybody would want two grants. You know, it's one of these political things in a way. So I had to quit. So I went to work uh, for New England Mutual Life uh, as a management trainee. And I was with them for five years. And I ended up uh, as the supervisor of the main computer run. And I've never looked at a computer again. <laughs> Those days, we, we programmed to the computer. There were no languages, no Fortran or anything like that. And uh, so I'd go home at nighttime, and my brain would go, one, nothing, yes, no, and uh, ask me a question. And that's exactly what was going on. I got up to equal to or greater than. <laughs> now, but anyway. Back up a little bit. You mentioned you were married. And when did all that occur? And was this a I was married in 1947 while I was going to the U. And was it someone that you knew before the war? No, as a matter of fact, it was someone that I met at a dance up at Cushing. Cushing in Framingham? Cushing for hospital, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that is your current wife? I've only had one. That's wonderful. Right. I don't know whether it's wonderful or not. I just only had one. Mildred, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Or Amelia. Whichever you like to call it. Looking back now, how important do you think the military was the whole experience in your life, and how did it affect your life? Well, you can probably realize that of all of the very nice adventures I've had in life, and some of that was a nice adventure. My time in the band, my time in Australia. Uh, I never finished the story about the uh, police thing, but that's all right. It's not essential. Uh, I've, I've had a pl wonderful life. If I got bored at something, I did something else. I mainly succeeded. The one job that I had that I kept for more than five years was teaching. I fell in love with teaching, and until the last two years I taught, I was in heaven. What, what grade level did you teach? I, I taught both advanced placement biology and advanced placement chemistry. Of course, research experience, you know, it fitted me perfectly for it. And where did you teach? Norwood High School. And you are now retired? Oh, yes, 12 years. One of the Watch me smile. <laughs> <laughs> One of the questions we are asking a number of our veterans um, is how you feel about the difference of public opinion regarding veterans from your generation, World War II, versus the Korean War, which wasn't even considered a war at that time, and the Vietnam War? Well, I, I think, well, in the, in the Korean War, we were pursuing a policy which had been determined at the beginning of the Cold War. They finally woke up to the fact that the Russians weren't our friends and that they were making every attempt to expand their influence in the world. And we responded to it by going to the war in, in Korea. They had problems in Korea that, bless me, I never were, were had to have. I never had to fight in the cold. I, I don't think I'd survive it. I think that another thing, too, is it's awfully nice if you're a soldier to know that the people that you're fighting for not only appreciate your effort, but honor you for it. I think that's my comment on Korea. Of course, Korea, once again, when you look at the Korea operation, you realize you have a war now in which Navy is a small part of it. And uh, air attacks, I don't know if they ever had any. So that they never had the threat of being torpedoed, they never had the threat of uh, uh, being bombed or strafed or anything like that. So it was a dimensional war of ground fighting. Uh, that's not an easy job. That's a very challenging job. But it did, did lack some of the dimensions of World War II. I think it's unfortunate that when people came back from Korea that the, I think that the veterans of World War II probably recognized the pain and the suffering, particularly the people that had been in Europe that had fought in the cold and understand, well, you have to live in a snowbank, or you have to live in the mud. You know, pe people wouldn't do that no matter how much you paid them, but the, <laughs> you have to do this with a gun and people shooting at you. It gets a dimension of its own, you see? Mm -hmm. I think that the worst 
calamity that ever happened to the United States was the Vietnam War. I don't know as our politicians ever learn a damn thing, but I hope that they learn this. They're fooling around now, but they, it's, uh, we can't solve all of the problems in the world. We have our own problems. And, and I suppose that's saying something that, but that's what I learned from Vietnam. Now being a soldier, when Vietnam was being fought, I supported the troops. You understand, I don't care what the problem is. I don't care how lovely the enemy is. I don't care. They're, they're trying to kill my boys. They're mine. And so they get my support. But unfortunately, when the war was over, somehow we never made the connection with those veterans, with our veterans organizations. Perhaps, I don't know, we, we just failed to make the connection. Of course, the benefits, the, the things that we've got for the Vietnam War is a drug problem. Start off there. Uh, years ago when I was a kid, the drugs were limited to the ghettos and in the, you know, lower strata of society. They want to get up into the middle class. It's a very dangerous problem. It's pervasive because you don't have multi-million dollars invested in drugs and not have the middle class deeply involved in it. You see what I'm saying? Uh, I think it has also eroded our sense of honor. I think uh, our sense of integrity as human beings. Uh, I think people lie easier now. I think no longer do we see things in terms of black and white. We see it in shades of gray. Mm -hmm. A very, very dangerous thing to me. Before I ask you one or two final questions, is there anything else that you do want to um expand on, you had mentioned the, 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 the story well, about the police, if you'd oh yeah. like to. Well, when I came back from the first campaign, I walked into police headquarters and now had friends there, at, at very high level friends, you know, because they thought this was quite a novelty, this American soldier were interested in their little functions. And I said to them, I said, well, I'm going to be gone for a couple of weeks, I'm going down to Sydney. And so they said, well, if you're going to Sydney, wait a minute, uh, we'll have the superintendent write a letter for us. Superintendent, I'm not fooling around now, you know. So he wrote a letter and sealed it and gave it to me. He says, well, when you go down to Sydney, if you want, I'll go to the police headquarters. Well, Sydney, of course, is an extremely large city. And the Sydney Police Department was famous for some very dramatic police cases. The Shark Arm case in 1936, I think, was a very, very fabulous case of solving a murder. You know, it's a, it's, it's, Gets complicated, but take my word for it. It was a very, uh, very challenging piece of uh, detective work. So when I went down there, I missed the group that I was going to go with because something came up, and so I had to go with another fellow and myself. And the other fellow was a kid from Chicago, a Russian kid, incidentally, spoke English, of course. And uh, his idea of really living the lush life is to go to bed with comic books. And uh, but he was built like a block. So anyway, when we went down to Sydney, of course, we established a whole new life. I bumped into my buddies again, and we were having a wonderful time in the city, really grand. And then one day I woke up and I realized I had the letter and I had to go down to police headquarters. So I grabbed my friend, the Russian, whose name will come to me in a minute, and I said, you're coming with me today and I'm going to show you something you'll really appreciate. It'll be the comic book. So he stumbled along with me. He was kind of walked like a gorilla anyway. He was something. <laughs> Pete O'Connor. Ah, oh, what a boy. So anyway, I walked up the steps to police headquarters and I thought he'd go pale. He went, what, what are you, crazy? You know, what are you, mad? This is police station. He said, come on, let's go. So I walked in, walked up to the desk, and I said, I have a letter here. And I handed it to the sergeant on the desk. And he looked at the letter and he opened it up and he read it and he looked at me and he looked at the letter again and he put the phone and he caught it up. The first thing I know, they got a captain comes down the elevator and the guy on the elevator we go up. We're introduced to the superintendent of police. <laughs> this is, I'm telling you, I lived a wonderful life. And uh, he, they, he gave me the station. And, uh, we, and Pete Okama was amazed. He'd never been at a police station before. We were going right through the whole thing, you know? And uh, well, anyway. The thing of it was, we went through their files, I saw the shark arm case, I put my hand inside of the, uh, the hand that they took out of the belly of the shark to get the fingerprints, the whole, the whole thing, fabulous. And then they said to me, would you like to ride in a cruiser tonight? And I said, no, <laughs> I've got other plans, I did. But anyway, uh, 
But that was the end of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we're going to wrap this up. If there's anything else that you would like to add, think about that. But at the same time, is there one thought or one memory that you'd like to share with either your family, with the community, and or with future generations that will be on this tape to remember you by? I think there is something uh, that, as a society, we have a terrible temptation to overlook. We don't pay attention. The first thing I think, that I, I actually think of this quite often, the nicest thing that happened to me was I was born an American. Most of these people do not realize what a gift this is. They have no idea. They think everybody has this gift. Some of them should have been born in Africa or China or, a, a, you know, they don't have any idea of the opportunities that are here. It's, it's amazing. So that's the first thing I think that I gave a message to someone. Uh, if you're an American, you put that flag up. I walk down the street now and I see houses with these funny little flags with bunnies on them and I don't think that these people know that they're Americans or if they if it means anything to them. Uh, they just accept it as something that uh, they just get. And sometimes you have to pay for it, daily. But it's worth it. That's my message. Thank you, Mr. Fader. <laughs>